Yoshi here with me today so far. Um, if you are out there um, watching, go ahead and chat with us in the chat. We really enjoy it. Um, my name is Trisha and I am here to talk bugs again today. Um, we discuss insects every single Thursday, as you all know. Um, and I have a ground beetle under the microscope today. Um, I was thinking he could be a, I was thinking that he could be a cool one to draw, especially because of all of the really fun textures on it. Hi, Matthew! Um, especially with all the really fun textures on it, we've got punctations and striations on this specimen. Um, I do have it ID'd all ready for us, so we aren't going to have to worry about identifying it through the live stream like last week. Um, and I know the defining characteristics to get us there. So with all of those things, um, I think that this will be a, a good bugo to start. Punctations and striations, yes, very much so. Um, so the world is not ready. You may not be ready, but, but this beetle is, is showing up with all of the fun things. Now, um, last week I told you that there was a really, really cool fly anatomy graphic that I couldn't find and I took a little bit of time looking for it. I found it. Um, I just posted it in the chat box. Um, admittedly, you could get so buried in this anatomy thing, so I don't want to lose y'all, but um, feel free to uh, poke around in it um, and check some out some of the really cool um, pictures. Trisha, did you see my fly email last week? I thought I responded to it, Hashi, um, but if I did not respond to it, I apologize. I did read it, and I will make a note to myself to finish that. I do have more emails to finish after our live stream tonight, so email Hashi. Sorry that it took me an extra little bit of time. All right. Um, so we've got a ground beetle here. Now, ground beetle is going to be, um, I was just excited to see it. Oh, good. Okay, good. Um, no, I, um, I will, I will send you back an email really soon. I, um, just, you know. All right. So, oh, Susan, did you look, are you looking at the fly graphic? It's a lot of fun um, to look at all of the individual sclerites and all of the bristles have their own names and they get really long and complex and confusing and we love it for them. Um, anyway, so um, this is our ground beetle here today. Now, ground beetle is going to be our common name for this individual, um, but ground beetle is not a common name that is... That is not species specific. When you say ground beetle, you are actually referring to an entire family of insects, and that family is Crabity. All right, Crabity are all of our ground beetles. Now, um, if we flip this beetle over, I have to take the label off of it really quick. If we flip this beetle over and we look at it from a ventral point of view and we look at the very very hind leg right there you can see right here that weird extra little piece at the base of the hind leg that is an expanded trochanter alright um, Sometimes we'll call it an enlarged trochanter. Um, so that trochanter is normally very, very small in between the hip and the femur. Kind of like that little pizza shaped or a little like uh, essentially the shape of a kneecap that rounds out and helps it turn. But in all ground beetles, in all um, beetles in the family Carabidae, they've got this enlarged trochanter that looks like this big additional little, uh, this big additional muscle on the back of the hind leg. Alright, so that is characteristic number one for helping us identify this guy. So that gets us 
Um, that gets us to family. Now, to get us to genus, that is, oops, Claria, Clanius, there it is. Okay. To get us to genus or Clanius, um, it's a little bit trickier, but um, they have this kind of body shape along with being like incredibly metallic and orange legs. All of the beetles in this genus look similar to this. All right, um, they'll have different, um, they'll have different like colors for their iridescence on the head and pronotum. So the different species might be a red purple mix. This is like a green red mix. Some of them have a little bit of blue in their metallics. So um, really it's like the color of iridescence and where you're located in the country to help you ID these to there. And then to get into Aestivus, um, there is some arguments as to, um, some people call it a group rather than a species, um, and that just means that some people aren't sure that they are all the same species. Some people think it's like multiple species that all look so similar that we are identifying them as one, but they should be divide, subdivided. Um, so the, it's working on it. But the characteristic as it stands right now is if you look at the antenna to get to this species or this group of species, um, you want to look at the third antenna mirror or the third segment of the antenna. Um, and it is longer than both first, the first and second combined and the fourth one. All right, oops, that's it. Um, so this segment here is longer than both of these two, and this segment is longer than this one, and that will get you to this species. All right, so let me go ahead and give me give me one moment to write this G, to write this species in. C H L A E. N I U S A E S T E S T E S. Okay. Woohoo! Bad news, it was a clothes moth. Oh no! Is this related to the caterpillar hunter beetle? It has a sort of similar structure and leg shape. Yes. The caterpillar hunter is in the same family of beetles. So they are both carabidae. Um, they're both species of ground beetles. Good observation. So because I can, with this beetle at an angle, I can see the entire beetle under one microscope view, I can use the microscope to measure the length of this friend. So from the front of the head, um, where the head ends, I'm not including the mouth parts, from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen, this specimen is... 1.63 centimeters long. 1.63 centimeters. All right. I think that that gives us they have the sort of generic beetle shape that I think of when I think of a beetle. <laughs> That's funny, but yes. So ground beetles are very, very, very common beetles. And so when people think of like a stinky beetle, when you flip over a rock, most people are thinking of this type of ground beetle. Um, that's fair. All right. 
so for our ground beetle, for our ground beetle here, um, we're going to be starting off with just a really light line sketch, and then we're going to be zooming in, checking out different features. I'm going to tell you right now, I was zooming in before class, and I've noticed some odd things happening up in the head region, especially near the mandibles. I think it has some extra mouth parts that I'm not sure what they are, but we'll see it, and we'll chat about it. So... To start our head here, the head is pretty small in comparison to the rest of the body. Good morning, Chaos! Welcome to the fun! Um, so I'm going to be starting this head off kind of small, and then instead of starting it like a D, like I start most of my heads, I'm actually going to be starting it with two parentheses shapes here, and then I'm going to cap it off at the bottom, and... Um, once I get to the top of these parentheses, instead of just connecting them, I'm going to create a little bit of a plateau where it comes together a little bit, comes up forward, creates a, a plateau, and then comes back down towards the head. Um, and my goal is to get this plateau as even as possible, but when we zoom in, I will be modifying it and fixing some of these lines. So... Just getting that rough shape in for us today. Then we've got the pronotum. All right, that's that next. That's this next shiny green part. All right, so this whole this segment right here, that's the pronotum, the first segment of the thorax. It's where the first pair of legs are connected, and the first pair of wings, the elytra, are connected to the pronotum. The, at the base. Alright, so um, looks like it is uh, fairly wide in comparison to the head, so I'm going to make sure that the pronotum does come out a little bit past the head, and then is around along the top. And once you get closer to the bottom, those lines do go kind of parallel a little bit and then cross over. So let's see. That looks about right, except that I am going to make my pronotum just a little bit smaller. More like, more like that. Alright, so the pronotum does get a little bit more narrow at the base here, but then when you look at the elytra, or those really hard outer shells right here, that gets wider once again. So, let's see. The elytra is about time and a half the length of the head and the pronotum combined. So if I was going to take, if I was going to take, I'm going to just do it on a piece of paper today, the head and the pronotum, give myself a half mark, I would go one and a half, boop, that's about right. So I know about how long the elytra is going to be, so now all I've got to do is connect these two things. I'm not going to start at the very end here because I want you to notice that the elytra look like they start a little bit higher, so I'm going to kind of come up just a little bit. There is not much of a, um, there's not much of a shoulder angle. A lot of times you'll have that humeral angle here. Um, on the elytra that kind of shoulder off, but these are definitely more round, more robust. It gets pretty wide before it comes back into being narrow again. Just trying to make sure that this beetle's elytra stays fairly symmetrical here. about right to me. 
Um, this beetle, from the back end of its abdomen, even has a couple additional segments back here. So we're going to be adding a little bit of the abdomen that's going to be past these wings. Uh, right here in the very, very center of our sketch is going to be where these wings meet. So you can always add that vertical line here. And that gives us a pretty good idea of where all of the parts are going to be. It might end up making the head just a little bit bigger. Sounds like a plan. All right, we've got that nice, out, out, nice light outline. So we're going to zoom into the head and check it out. Um, the head is a really interesting one. I promise, I was just looking at it. on the on the head of this beetle here um, you have those really cool silvery compound eyes uh, you have antenna sockets for the antenna we've got lots of mouth parts um, both of the pelps are available to be seen the maxillary and the labial pulp will be pointing those out um, we can see mandibles and then we can see kind of additional mouth parts down there um, that are, they look almost like additional little smaller mandibles like underneath their mandibles. Um, it looks really impressive and so we'll be zooming in. I, I'm going to have to change the view to see them a little bit better. But, um, so I want to see it from the top like this first, and then we'll turn our specimen so that we can see all the other fun stuffs. So at least from my original sketch, I know about how large I want this, um, about how large I want the head to be. I do know right about where the widest part of my head is, and that's where I want these compound eyes to go. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to the edge of my head, right about here at that widest point, and I'm going to give myself the inlays of the compound eyes. Not the outside, but just like the inside here. Alright, and kind of connect them to the sides of the head. Now, notice that the compound eyes kind of expand past the edge of the head. So what I do is I'll take those lines then and expand and draw, finish that circle but it's going to be past the edge of the head where we kind of had originally planned to draw the head. All right, so the eyes go just a little bit past. So that once we erase that little sketch line on the inside, the eyes still get that kind of bulbous look. Now, at the base of the compound eyes, kind of underneath them, you can see that the head kind of comes towards itself and there's just a little bit of a neck region here. So I want to make sure to give our little carabid or our little ground beetle a little neck portion here. And then instead of connecting it straight across, I do want it to be just a really stretched out U. I want it to slightly bar and uh, arch downward. All right, this way right there. Okay, so now we've got our uh, compound eyes all situated. We're going to be giving our space for those antenna. Um, these antenna are long straight antenna. We would consider them filiform. Um, filiform is kind of the most basic antenna type. Um, it just means long and straight without any other cool features.
Um, generally, filiform antenna are... They don't have hundreds of segments. They have, you know, somewhere in the 5 to 20 segments range. Um, small enough that you can actually count the segments on them. Because um, if you get really, really long and thin, like a praying mantis or a cockroach, then you're going to actually consider it more hair-like, probably. Cetaceous. Let's see. Looks like a filament. Exactly. Filiform like a filament. Looking at forward to zooming in on the butt end, are those some cute little Cersei? They look like cute little Cersei, but beetles don't get Cersei. I believe that those are his male reproductive claspers that are sticking out back there. Okay, so right around here in front of the uh, compound eyes, I'm going to give it just a little bit of like a, a straight kind of platform region that's going to be where these antenna come off. Um, just make sure that that third antenna segment is, the, is longer than the first two combined. That's a defining characteristic of this species. So we've got the first segment here, the second segment, nice and teeny tiny. And then the third segment, nice and long. And then four, it was also just a little bit shorter. Alright, now um, I have not counted the segments on this antenna, so I'm going to stop at four right now and finish the mouth parts, and then we'll come back. So we've got that antenna started, we've got this started, we're going to come up forward just a little bit, and then we're going to change the focus so that we can see more of these mouth parts. So cool. Okay. So, there are a couple of different things happening here. Um, this beetle does have what we would call a clippius. The clippius is going to be a region, a sclerite on the front of the head that is still part of the head, but um, it's connected to the labrum or the upper lip. Um, that is going to be right here. There is a sclerite or a line that goes right across here and then this little green region would be the clippius. So when we have our little beetle, if I take this and I bring a line all the way across the front, that's going to include the clippius, and then I want to create kind of like a little suture or a little line. On the head, it's not a suture, it's a sulcus. Um, but there's a little line right here that's going to separate the, the front of the head, or the fronds, from the clippius here. And then in front, you can see there's this little bit of a rectangular shape, this guy right here. That is the labrum, L-A-B-R-U-M, the upper lip. So it looks like it's kind of pointed on each side. Looks like it's kind of wider on each side, and there seems to be, yep, one, two, three, four, five, six. So if you look right here along the front of the labrum, there are six evenly spaced, um, evenly spaced, um, I want to say sockets, but they're not sockets. Essentially hair, hairs. There are six evenly spaced hairs right here across the front. So. 
One, two, three, four, five, six. Hello, a cross friend. And then underneath this guy right here, that's a mandible. We've got the mandible on the left and the right side. Um, the mandibles are going to be, when you draw them, they actually connect um, not up here, but just a little bit lower. They're going to be connecting back here, kind of where, like halfway back to the antenna. And then the mandible up on the left looks like it was the one on the top, so we're going to draw it that same way here. We're going to take that mandible, we're going to bring it all the way up to the front, past that, um, past the labrum. It gets a really nice sharp point. Notice that this is a predatory beetle. It's going to be eating other insects, so it's got to be nice and sharp. And then the one on the right is not exactly even, so it, it cuts a little bit short, and that's the way I'm going to draw it. Now, um, there are all kinds of palps here. So, if I, I'm going to zoom out just a skosh, just an itty bitty bit, because I want to see, there we are, the, the palps. All right, that's a leg, that's an antenna, there's the palps. Okay. So the maxillary palps are going to be longer. It's this one here, and then this one kind of goes behind the leg, so it's a little bit more tricky to see. Um, but this one is a maxillary palp. It is three segmented. It's connected to a part underneath the mandibles called the maxilla. All right. Um, and so it is actually pretty long here. We're going to go one... two, three, and then on both sides. And if you want, you can even make, like, um, the maxillary palps are not even in, in the microscope, but when you draw them, they can be even. All right, so we've got those maxillary palps. Then you have another set of palps, and they're connected to the bottom jaw rather than the maxillary. The bottom jaw is called the labium, so those palps are considered labial palps. And these appear to be two segmented. It's this one here, one, two, and this one here, one, two. Those are the, the shorter ones, and they exist on the bottom. Now, um, if you've been around for a while, you may recognize my fun common name for them, mouth fingers. And that's exactly what they are. They do this. They help push food into the mandibles. They're mouth fingers. I mean, can you imagine not having the ability to, like, push food into your mouth? That would be sad. So, we've got maxillary palps and labial palps. Now, the big question then exists, what about these things? We have two here and two here. And we're going to zoom in and check them out. My guess is that they are additional parts of the maxilla. But I haven't looked at this beetle's mouth parts while it was flipped over. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to flip it over and we're going to see where those are connected. Okay, I think that they're connected to the maxilla. 
Um, it is this, from this point of view, it's this guy right here, and he looks connected to the same place that the maxillary palp is connected to, right kind of there in the middle of the, uh, in the middle of the mouth sandwich. It's cool because this outer pair here and here almost looks like an additional palp. And this here and this here, they look like mandibles, but um, they have lots of hair on the inside of them. It's just cool. So I'm gonna add I'm gonna add some of these guys in here. All right. So that's going to be. That's going to be the head and all of the wonderful pieces that there are on it. Um, if you were curious about the parts of the head, um, ground beetles are easy one to um, ground beetles are an easier one to discuss. The top of the head, the top of the head between the compound eyes and back. That's what we consider the vertex of the head. The front of the head here, which would be considered the in front of the vertex, right? Kind of in front of the compound eyes and up to the antennal sockets. That's the fronds, spelled F-R-O-N-S. And then you've got that clippius up in the front. Yeah. The only other, um, the only other region of the head that gets a name, other than the vertex, the fronds, and the clippius, is the side of a beetle's head. So if you're looking at the side, the cheek of an insect is called the gina. It would be over here on the side. There are definitely extra teeth and spines and stuff. It's really nifty. Alrighty, so that gives us the head and all of the pieces. I am going to go ahead and count our antennal segments really quick. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. We're going to do it again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Alright, there are 11 antennal segments. This is going to get you an idea of the length of our length of our antenna right here. Um, I'm going to add our segments. Bloop! I'm going to just finish these up. So I've got one, two, three, four here. I need seven more. One, two, three, four. The remainder of the segments are all sub-equal until you get to the very end. The final segment looks just a little bit smaller. That's going to give us an antenna. Um, my antenna is a little bit short. Ideally, it would... I'm going to make it longer. get it without messing up my ratio up here with that third end segment. So that's all right. Now we're going to check out the pronotum. Now, um, one of the characteristics for this genus that I didn't mention is that the pronotum is densely, 
Densely? How do I spell that? Punctate. So let's check out what densely punctate looks like. So this is what a punctate exoskeleton looks like. It looks like it's just been poked a whole bunch of times by a pin or a needle. Lots and lots of little dots on there. Now, um, to, get the, uh, to get the shape of my pronotum here, I do need to follow this U that I've already created from the head and then continue it up a little bit to create that point off to the sides. And I'm actually pretty happy with the pronotum shape that I originally had. So I'm going to darken this kind of parenthesis shape. And then I'm going to erase any of these sketchy lines that I don't need anymore. Let's see. Pretty straight. Yep, I'm going to make it straight. And then inside of this pronotum here, um, the characteristic is densely punctate. So if you have the time and energy, the idea would be to stipple inside of the pronotum. Stippling is a word that I haven't used in the past, but it just means to shade with lots of dots. Although it's really difficult to stipple with a pencil, this is a lot easier to do with a pen um, because it'll kind of create those dots for you just by touching the paper. But with a pencil, you kind of have to make the circle shape. So you end up with um, not even dots, whereas pens, you can make these dots really individually very even. Uh, but the head is also densely punctate, so if we're going to do it to the pronotum, we might as well do it to the head also. Okay. When and where was this specimen collected? Great question. I can answer that for you. Um, this specimen was collected on May 22nd of 2022 in Pennypack Park in Philadelphia, PA. I was blacklighting that night and these beetles were running around everywhere. I collected, I think, two or three of them. They were very common in the region. So the end of the pronotum does have hairs. If you've no if you notice that, you could take note of it. Um, you can add those hairs to the very end if you'd like. I'm gonna scooch on back to the elytra. adjective striate to describe striations. Um, the elytra are striate or they are covered in striations um, or these long, li long thin lines. Um, these ones do have small like um, small punctures along the lines but the striations still exist there so we're going to call it striate. Um, 
way up at the top of the elytra. I did refocus it just a little bit so that you can see the scutellum. It's right there. This little itty bitty teeny triangle, that's the scutellum in between the elytra. And remember last week, the, uh, the scutellum on the fly was our defining characteristic as, um, as a tachinid. Uh, well, the post scutellum. But in this beetle, it's just a little itty bitty teeny tiny triangle right here, the base of where the elytra touch. Now make sure that when you start your elytra, um, you don't start at the bottom. You do come up a little bit. You can see they are kind of tucked back there. Um, I'm pretty happy with the uh, with the shape of my beetle. I think it's a cute tellum. Aww, that's so funny. You're funny. Part of me that wants my beetle to be just a little bit wider. Yep. So I'm gonna be making my beetle just a little bit wider, I believe. Yeah. all these little sketchy lines that I don't need on the inside or the outside of these of this elytra all right yeah like leather and decorative stitching I love it and then how they diverge around the triangle. Yeah, so if we look, I guess we could even we could even zoom in right there to the very beginning to see kind of how the striations interact with that sputellum just a little bit. And then some of these striations, oh wait, none of them actually connect. Some of them I thought connected on the top and bottom, but it looks like they don't. They stay individual striations all the way down. Cool. All right. So if we wanted to count them, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, tish. So, there are eight visible striations on each elytra. I do believe, elytron, on each elytron, um, I do believe there is one additional striation along the edge that because of the curvature we can't see as well. So, there are eight major ones and one off to the side that's a little bit trickier to see. So, I'm going to go ahead and get to going. Let's see. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Eight. 
Alright, so you've got all of the striations, and then I might even put some like dots along the striations to show all of their, there are small punctations along these lines. Um, this could be a really cool texture to finish on both sides, but I am going to leave mine just um, one-sided, but you can always feel free to finish, please finish both sides of your buggies. Rabbids or ground beetles are really well known for having really, really smelly toxins in their body. They are poisonous. Do not eat ground beetles. All right, they're not not food. Um, they smell really, really bad when you pick them up too. I swear, every time I'm collecting buggies, I pick up a new ground beetle and then I have a different smell and it's like a daily occurrence when I'm on road trips I'm collecting and therefore picking up all kinds of weird beetles alright so this is the very end of our abdomen here the abdomen that you can see outside of the elytra um, we've got what appears to be three segments here at the end so the first one is kind of bulbous, a little bit wide. It doesn't go very far out. It's just that first segment that was viewed. The next one actually gets, the next one gets a little bit more narrow. It's still kind of flat here. So that's our second abdomen segment. And I think we're a little bit too big already. So we're going to shrink it down just a little bit. All right. <laughs> and then this third one here, um, it has those um, hooks on the end of it, and generally when I see hooks at the end of a beetle or hooks at the end of a fly or a dragonfly or any kind of insect, I imagine that what I'm seeing is a male, because a lot of times it's the males that have to hold on to the females with some type of hook or grasping thing. Um, do they spray a toxin or just get it on your hands? Um... It, you can smell it from further away than a person's hands. So it does go airborne, um, but it comes out of a scent gland on the bottom of the body. I might even be able to show you the scent gland. I believe it's between the second and third pairs of legs on the bottom. trying to get a good idea of what this uh, the end of this guy looks like and then add these little hookies at the end yay alrighty well that gives us textures on the head and the pronotum the elytra the abdomen so now all we have to really worry about are the legs and while I'm thinking about it let's go see if we can find the uh, Ooh, the stink land. Alright, I didn't break it. Good. Be able to see it. 
So the odor is secreted. Some of them are awful smelling. Yes. The odor is a chemical that is secreted out of a, um, out of a gland. Um, it can definitely stain your hand like a red brown color. But I think where it is, is underneath the second pair of legs. I believe it's right about here. legs. We're about to draw the legs, so we don't have to spend any more bonus time looking at them. But the legs are cool. Let's draw them. Alright, so if you look over at the right hand side of our beetle, kind of what those legs look like over on the right, that's how we're going to be drawing them today. Um, so this is kind of a very natural resting pose for our ground beetles here, the middle leg the underneath the hind leg. Um, the front leg, we're going to be start, we're going to be straightening those tarsal segments out so that it looks like it's sitting flat. Um, and because I drew my antenna on the right side, I'm going to put my legs on the left side so that they don't cross over each other. <laughs> So our ground beetle is going to start off with that femur going in a forward direction. This would be the pro femur. Are these cursorial legs? Yes, these are cursorial legs. Great question, Susan. Um, cursorial meaning running legs. These are very, very fast beetles. They are considered cursorial legs. All I want to know is, can he sing Hey Jude? Sadly, no. This is not that kind of beetle. All right, femurs going up, or what we could consider the pro femur. The tibia is moving forward, starts kind of narrow, gets a little bit wider. There is a tibial spine. It exists on the inside. So if we start our tibia here, it goes kind of inwards towards the head just a little bit, gets wider at the end, and then has... A tibial spine going towards the body. Ground beetles have a five 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 tarsal formula. So we're going to have five tarsi on the front, the middle, and the hind legs. I was trying to get a view of all of the tarsi in focus at the same time, which is going to be a little bit tricky, but here we are. We can do it this way. And this way you can see that tibial spine too. First one is what I would consider kind of a rectangular segment, and then we're going to have three triangular segments, one, two, 
going to go right into these words, so I'm going to erase a little bit of them. One, two, three. And then that last segment right there is kind of a raindrop, narrow at the base, round, kind of raindroppy. And you do get two tarsal claws up here. What's up? And that's our front leg, our pro leg. And then we're going to go down to the middle leg here. So for the middle leg of our cute little ground beetle friend, oh, I forgot I have to change the angle slightly. Okay. All right, for the middle leg, it almost appears like it's coming out from, well, it almost looks like it's coming out from the abdomen, but the thorax continues past. This is only the first segment of the thorax, so the abdomen probably doesn't start till right around here. Um, this is where our, our middle and our hind legs are connected. So if our middle leg is connected here, it's going to come out right around here off of the edge, and you've got that femur that's not incredibly long coming out this side because it's already it's already... You know, it's connected way back here. Um, so we've got the femur coming out. Maybe I'm going to make it a little bit, a little bit. We'll make it a little bit longer just so that I can put an angle on the end of it here and then make the tibia come in towards the body. The tibia looks really long in comparison. So um, these are nice long running legs. Starts narrow, gets a little bit wide. All right, I'm pretty happy with that. The tibia goes about halfway down the elytra, and then you have those five tarsal segments. And now with those tarsal segments, that first one is kind of blocked by the hind femur, or what we would call the meta femur. Um, these, though, I can add, and then we'll just erase the ones we don't need. So we're going to go, the first one is rectangular, one. Then three triangular segments, two, three, four, and then a raindrop segment with the claws. Um, and something cool about these tarsal segments, we can look at them from the side momentarily, but along the bottom side of all of these tarsal segments are really, really thick hair pads. And um, that is not something that I commonly see in this family of beetles. So um, I thought that that was kind of cool to see. Um, and I will show it to you once we get, once we turn the leg again. All right, front leg, middle leg coming down. Now all we need is the hind leg. We know the middle leg's connected right around here. That would put our hind leg connected right around here. Um, the hind leg is coming out at this angle, so we're going to let it come out right about here. And it's going to go past kind of this tibia. There we are. So where it's crossing over is kind of the bottom of the tibia and the beginning of that first tarsal segment here for that middle, for that hind leg. I'm going to make it just a little bit longer, I think. That's as long as it wants to be. Okay, now I'm going to scooch our microscope so that we can see more of the tibia and the hind leg. So the tibia here does go pretty much to the end of the elytra, but not the end of the body. So if I was going to take this the metafemur and add a tibia to it. I'm going to be adding a tibia that starts pretty narrow, goes in towards the body, and only goes about as long as the elytra. And it looks like I'm erasing just a little bit more of those middle tarsals. 
car seat. All right, and then we've got that tibial spine on the inside and five tarsal segments. One, two, three, four, five, and the claws. All right, let's go look at the bottom of these tarsal segments. Okay, so pads is a little bit different than what these are. They almost look like, they almost look like brushes or combs, or bristles, bristles that make combs, and all of the legs look like this. They have these really, really thick rows of bristles on the underside of the tarsal segments. Um, the only thing that I can think of is that this might actually help them run faster if they have... Um, more of an ability to kind of push off of the ground. Maybe it increases the friction between them. You Increasing the friction would slow them down, though. But um, maybe it helps them push off of the ground better if they have more of the jagged edges. But it's not just the back leg. Here's the middle leg. Right here. And then the front leg, right here. Cool. Alright, C H L E. Alright, I rewrote my name up here so that I, because I erased a part of it. Got to rewrite my name above it just a little bit. Planius Astinus. So that is our cute little ground beetle for the day. Um, I hope that everybody had a good time drawing it with me. Now, like a wheel, increasing the friction would help them run faster and with more control. tibia of the front leg. Um, and I guess the tibia on the middle leg has it pretty strong. The tibia on the hind leg has it, but there aren't as many on the hind leg. something cool to look at. And way back there in the back from this image, you can see that the expanded trochanter does sit separately from the body. So that's that trochanter right there that we started the class with that helps you identify that it's a ground beetle. they're not sliding so friction won't have a slowing effect. That makes sense. So when they're actively hitting the ground with their legs, increasing the friction is going to increase their ability to grab onto the substrate or to push off of the substrate from. So it would make them, in theory, faster. 
And that makes sense in that they have running legs. Cursorial. Awesome sauce. Well, um, I think that is us for the day. Um, we went back to one of my native species of beetles for a minute. Um, I just haven't had the time to pull out any more of the, uh, any more of the big pretty ones from my, um, from my friend, but I will be able to pull some of those out shortly. Well, give me a couple weeks. Um, I am driving to Pittsburgh next week. Um, so if anybody is out there and, um, if anyone is out there and curious to meet me and you are closer in the region of Pittsburgh, I will be at the World Oddities Expo, um, showing off my live animals and selling some of my art. Um, you know, I'm hoping that one or two of the places someone shows up. It would be so cool to see somebody. Um, so here we are. I'll go ahead and share my drawing with you in its entirety. This is um, what my ground beetle looks like. And admittedly, now that I've drawn him wider, I want him thinner again. I like this side more than this side. So there's a chance that I'm going to be erasing and modifying the edge of this beetle just a little bit so he's not so wide. Um, we're going to fix it right now. Maybe. Now, we're going to have to fix it later. But that's my cute little ground beetle friend. Um, and uh, if you know anybody who, uh, who wants to take some out school classes, I'm teaching virtually not every day anymore, just Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays um, because of my travel schedule. Um, uh, feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel. That helps me. Um, that helps me a whole bunch, and maybe one day we'll be able to monetize this channel. Um, right at the moment, everything runs off of um, right, runs off of tips and motivation. So, right about there is my PayPal link. Um, in case you want to buy me a coffee or help me keep my um, keep my collection up to date. Um, I did just buy a whole new, um, I did just go and buy some more pins so that I can make sure that I have all of the right sizes for when bug season actually starts. I don't know about any of you, but I'm already starting to have dreams about bug collecting. Um, it started to get warm in my region and I saw an insect outside and now I'm dreaming about bugs. This is just what happens in the dead of winter um, in Trisha's head. Um, so, right about there at Insectopia2015, that's my tag on Facebook and Instagram. If you are curious about going and checking any of that out, I definitely, um, suggest coming and hanging out with us on those platforms. I, uh, I'll post my drawing from this champ, from this live stream on Facebook, and if you would like to post yours from this week, you can go ahead and leave it in the comment in that post. It's so cool to see everybody's drawings all in one place. Um, how do I access your PayPal? Clicking on the square does not a right. So, the QR code here you can use through your phone or um, in the description box below there is an actual link um, that you can click. You saw a marmorated stink bug yesterday. Alright. Um, Matthew, I don't know if you know this, but the brown marmorated stink bug is what my research was in. Um, I ran a biological control lab and we were doing classical biocontrol of the BMSB uh, with a parasitoid wasp from China. Um, we were testing to see if this small parasitoid, an egg parasitoid, was released, if it would also attack the native species. It was really, really cool research. Um, and uh, I had personally kind of decided that it attacked too many of our native species, but... Um, about four years into the research, it became null and void because the wasp came from China by itself. So Trisulcus japonicus, the small egg parasitoid, um, 
was not released here in the United States by, um, by scientists, even though we considered it. It made it here all on its own, separately from the stink bug, in a stink bug egg cluster that was parasitized. Really kind of a cool story. And so then they were able to watch it, and at that point, um, I had entered the education side of things. So, that is my little brown marmorated stink bug story. I also have two whiteboard videos on BMSB on this channel. Um, so if you go and check those out, they're kind of fun little short videos. Um, Alright, let's see. This is my email. I attempt to answer everybody in a timely manner. Um, Hashi, I apologize for not doing that, but um, most of the time I'm okay at it. Uh, feel free to share your drawings with me. If you don't want to share them on Facebook, email them to me because I love to see them anyway. Um, Alright, I think... I have answered all of the questions in the chat box. So did your research help with monitoring it now that it is here? Yes! Um, the research that we did on the stink bug um, parasitoid did help with the research teams that are now researching how the, um, how the wasp is doing here now. Um, but I had been rearing this small egg parasitoid in a lab for four years, um, learning all about its life history, what it attacks, what it doesn't attack, how it, um, like, uh, what it chooses. We did choice, no choice tests, so we would put the wasp in a vial with an egg cluster from our marmorated and from native species, and we would see if it chose one egg cluster over the other, if it parasitized both, um, and so all of that information was able to roll over, and all of those tests would be tests that the scientists would have had to have done when they noticed that it was here. But because we were already we were already three or four years ahead in the research, they were able to kind of jump some of those steps, and they were able to watch how the wasp affected the native species um, in real time, which was cool. Alright, I hope that you all have a fabulous rest of your week. I look forward to seeing everybody next week. If there is an insect that you want me to look at, or maybe if you want to pick an order for me to choose from, it would be, uh, it would be good. I always love your, I always love your input. Um, beetles are some of my favorites. I think that they are, like, um, an insect that I can draw fairly well. I like beetles and I like bees and wasps. Those are my favorite things to draw. Um, but we do have other things. I think it's been a while since we've drawn a true bug. Um, I think we've only ever drawn one water scorpion our entire time here, and I think it was our second or third week of drawing, so it's been over, it's been probably over two years now since we've drawn a water scorpion. Um, that could be cool. Or a great day, Chaos. Thank you so much, Nancy. I appreciate that. Um, so, you know... If you, um, have we ever done net-winged beetles? I was looking at net-winged beetles. All right. I was looking at net-winged beetles today, considering doing one. So we can definitely do a net-winged beetle next week. That would be fun. I'm down. I'm writing it down. Have a fabulous rest of your week, and...